kind of you. Hello, everyone. I'm Pavel Odinsov. I am here from FastNetMon project. Uh, FastNetMon project focuses on uh, DDoS mitigation and detection. Uh, and for more than 10 years, I work in uh, network security area in, in, di in, different, in different directions, but mostly I focus on exactly on this area. But my experience can be quite unusual because I'm uh, work with IPv6 and cybersecurity mostly for from perspective of a software engineer. So and my talk will be cover more specific things from like implementation side instead of like operational experience. So uh, all the time I'm very open about any kind of conversation, talks, ideas. All the time I'm very happy to talk about new stuff and in particular IPv6. So you can find ways how you can contact me. And actually you can see one site here, it's like GitHub. And I think, you know, it's a good point to bring the attention, you know, it's only one site which actually bothers me about IP, lack of IPv6 support. Because, you know, when I switch to IPv6 on the environment, like just to test how it works, it's like one of the main deal brokers. So folks from GitHub, please fix it. <laughs> So uh, let's move forward. My talk is, okay, uh, uh, no, no. Uh, so my talk uh, has a name like DDoS uh, detection and IPv6. So, because when people say like DDoS, so there are actually lots of meanings about what actually DDoS is. Because even actually, because you know, we may have a type of network attack, like which is typically well known, like when you when your like favorite site experiences voltage, it can be explained like okay, we experience a DDoS attack. But unfortunately, DDoS term is very wide, so many things can be explained, like even software bugs, uh, like buffer overflow used in special way. And I just want to start explaining what kind of DDoS I want to focus on. So, and of course, I will start from ancient stuff, very old stuff. So. Protocol version IPv4, level three. So uh, old, outdated, but it's very good to look and about types of DDoS attacks because you know when you read media, you may find out lots of exciting ways how you know people explain and name DDoS attacks. But you know when technical person reads something like application level attacks, protocol level attacks, but actually what what kind of protocol do you mean like? Protocol can be HTTP, protocol can be PGP, protocol can be ARP. It's not clear what kind of attack we are talking about. And in this presentation, I would like to start from explicitly clarifying what kind of DDoS attacks we are talking here. So what is DDoS attack? What does it mean like this attack was implemented using level four? So, and look, let's start look on uh, uh, message format for IPv4. So we can see actually lots of fields here. Fortunately, IPv6 is not that complicated, but we have actually two types of fields here. So first type of fields is surveys. They are crucial to deliver packet from one point to another, like, and they cannot be changed. So because for example, if you mess up with field version or IHL or maybe your uh, destination or checksum, it will be dropped somewhere before it will reach your target, like your service, which just became target of DDoS. But everything else here can be changed because it actually how bad guys implement DDoS attacks. So they can use different terms of service field. Why not actually? Uh, they can change total length. They can use like zero total length. In some cases it may trigger very interesting circumstances. They can try actually use identification field, which is not recommended by, it may appear, you know, when you, intentionally want to create packets which can like break something. Oh, of course, lots of fun with uh, don't fragment fields, more fragment fields, fragment offset, it can be randomized very well because we have certain bits here, like time to leave. It's also a good point because why not? You can actually, by using like very small time to leave, you can actually cause a router of destination and attack it part to, like drop many, many, many packets. And again, it may cause some interesting effects. Protocol field, fine, can be changed, can be randomized, can be set to specific one. That's actually why I said like, when people say like protocol, like level attacks, which actually protocol type, many of them actually, you can even randomize them. And 
Next thing, which is very important about delivering uh, traffic from one thing to another. So, and actually it's like source address or destination address. And for IP protocol, it's not required to keep source address. Not like as legitimate and many networks, unfortunately, will allow using your fake source address. So it also can be randomized. And finally, destination address. You may actually randomize it because in some cases it may cause some interesting effect because for example, in recent like months or actually I would say years, it started to be very common when attacks, it's not hitting specific like slash 32 or slash 100, but a range of them. Sometimes it's very big range and it's this effect itself can cause problems. And of course, and when we move to payload, in payload, we can do many, many, many interesting things. So you can see we have, we may have lots of types of attacks, which can be explained by just this diagram. Uh, what kind of like, so we may actually may have every, literally any field in IPv4 header randomized. And then we will have like TTL flood, maybe protocol flood. And that's actually why I don't like this explanation, this classification about this. Like, and that's why I like idea to focus on like using level of protocol we use in this case, in this case of Alex. And let's just compare IPv4 diagram with IPv6 one. So it looks much simpler. Does it mean that we cannot implement all fancy attack types mentioned for IPv4? Unfortunately, it doesn't. So again, we have next header, which is protocol. It can be randomized. Hop limit, again, can be randomized. Payload length, fine, can be any. We can like use it fake one, real one. Source address can be randomized. Again, unfortunately, destination address. It's different story. Actually, IPv6 creates a really great vector of DDoS attacks, which can use only the like destination address. Because when I said like, for IPv4 attacks, it's quite common to see attacks against range, but range in IPv4, it's small. Even if your company is very rich or very big, you may have like own like slash eight, maybe typically slash 16, but in case of IPv6, you own, you know, plenty of them. And then just attempt to send a single packet to every single IPv6 can cause problem. So, and it's actually means so for every di very different IPv6, for like message format, we have exactly the same attack vectors. Only one thing actually, which is be very beneficial for IPv6, it's quite unlikely to see fragmentation attack types because of implementation of uh, extension headers for IPv6 protocol, it's much more tricky to implement it. It may be dropped somewhere in the trains. So, and what we have here, and let's move, we perfectly describe it, what we have for L3. So what, and then let's talk about ways have people typically explain the, those kinds of attack types. So it's protocol flood. Typically it's not like random protocol. It's typically it's UDP, ICMP, TCP, GRA in some cases, and fragmentation attacks when actually you, your network starts receiving lots of packets like more fragments or don't fragment or something different. Spoofing attack types, all kinds of attacks when your like you see source of packet, which is actually not real because you may start seeing like lots of like malicious stuff from Google or Amazon. No, of course they cannot do it this way, but it means that somebody else in, the, in between you created fake one. So options flood, all kind of different tricks with IP6 options or IP4 options, TTL expiration attack and terms of service flood. L last one is weird. I actually never saw it. But everything else, in some cases, I saw it in real. So it's, from my perspective, I think it's a good way to start from the beginning, like what kind of attack we are talking about. Because when people say like, I have an attack, because if you can explain your kind of attack very well, then people can help you much better. And I can say like what we can do or we cannot. And st let's move from level three to level four. And what we have, for TCP, for example, because I, I just don't want to talk about the UDP because UDP is as you know, source port, destination port, that's literally all. But TCP is much more interesting. We have lots of fields. So every, every field here can be abused by attackers, like checksum in some cases, urgent, fine, window size, absolutely fine. So lots of different control flags, fine. They also can be used for attacking here. 
So, and then it means it's perfectly fine to use it for DDoS. But what is this actually special about this one? So, and actually nothing. What is special about IPv6 protocol about TCP? Of course, we can implement different attack type in this case, but is it different from IPv4? What, like when you experience TCP, like flag attack over IPv6 or IPv4, is it different? No, actually only one difference is source IP and destination IP from your perspective, because that's only one thing we care about. So that's why actually in my presentation, I will mostly talk about level three, but briefly about level four, because it's important and that's all what we're talking, what would like to talk about. So, and briefly from level four, we have, we may have source port attack, when just port randomized or port is set to zero destination port also ki kind of often stop and TCP sequence and all kinds of misuse of TCP flags. So that's topic what we are talking about from DDoS perspective. So in this case, we are not going to talk about sophisticated attacks on maybe some endpoint exposed by like web source. No, 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 no. We are talking about L3, L4. That's all we want to talk. And next, let's talk about scope. So we are talking, uh, uh, so in this case, but when we mix actually L3 and L4, you may notice some more marketing attack names. And here you go, we have amplification, like spoofing, like jerry food, but it's more like, you know, it's more like product names of attack types, you know, because when people say amplification, because actually, it's not important for you, was it amplificated traffic or not? It just explains like how attack was started, but result for you, it's exactly the same. It's like megabits, hundreds of megabits, gigabits, hundreds of gigabits of malicious traffic coming on your network. In this case, it's not important. And for you, it's like uh, UDP flood, which use fragmentation, like, and very uh, big packets. That's all you need to know. So it's back to my previous slides about like how you can explain attack type, because instead of using like, and lots of people, they like like, you know, buzzy words, like slow lorries, like iron cannon, but it doesn't explain nature of things. But when you can explain, I use packets with randomized source, fine, it's the best thing you ever can explain to those attacks. And next thing what we're talking, we are going to talk about is scope of IPv6. Like many people may say like IPv6 and attacks, is it, does it make sense? No, is it even real? Because many people, they actually haven't tried IPv6 and many, unfortunately, ISPs, they don't offer IPv6. And like, let's, you know, it's actually first thing and first map you can find out and you go like penetration rate of IPv6. And I think it's most popular diagram for this kind of pre this presentation. And you can see it's from Google perspective, actually you can notice like, like clear correlation that's very populated countries like maybe India here, like states, they have very good IPv6 uh, uh, enablement rate. So it's getting bigger. And when you're talking about DDoS, DDoS is not artificial thing created by, you know, shady genius somewhere in the middle of, you know, Alps or whatever. It's just function because it's not important where is the bad guy sitting in. They can sit in any countries. And media, they do love speculate about like, it's kind of attackers from this country or from this. It's not important for us. It's one of the things which is got kind of fortunate. They will use all IoT devices, your, or like, smart speaker phones, smart bulbs, smart, you know, Christmas trees, whatever you may see in your environment or your like, or your boxes somewhere for like security even actually, or for like a smart home. And they will use them for attack vector. So they, and it's, you may find out clear, clear, clear correlation between like how many people in this country, how often they use some smart devices. And then you can experience them maybe not immediately because you know, when country got some good penetration of internet, you need to wait some for some time before everyone buys like plenty of smart home devices for their home, like, and then wait, they will be used for us DDoS vector, unfortunately. So and that's why it's very important to see like what's penetration rate for everyone. And you can see on this graph, it's very good. Like many very big countries are getting IPv6 serious, but this diagram is absolutely incorrect and, uh, Veronica said absolutely right. This diagram missing is China. And one of the fascinating things about China, because you know, many of us hear success story about uh, Indian internet. 
like because it got IPv6 in very fast fashion. But for China, it's much more interesting. So let's look different uh, di uh, like map for Akamai. You can see like cal. Sorry about color selection. It wasn't my choice. I'm very sorry. <laughs> and so uh, you can see that color of like India and China it's close. It means we are about what is in percentage? Let's look at that. This one also data from Akamai. And you know, they're on 16% of IPv6 now, but it's not important. 16% is not a big number, but check numbers year ago. It was about zero, maybe 2%, I don't know. And it's great dynamic. So if you can consider this kind of dynamic, we can expect maybe 15% in the next two years. So it's why it actually it's clear, it's growing. And China has enormous population, lots of people, uh, every kind of people, they want like buy like, some IoT devices, some equipment, whatever, lo lots of connected devices they have. And they, of course, will be used for DDoS attack. So, and from experience of Fastnet One project, I would say that most of our users who use actually IPv6 in their network, they experience at least one attack over IPv6 protocol per month. It's not often, but it's one of the things which can, you know, when it times happens, it may be happening Christmas night, New Year, whatever your favorites, uh, you know, your birthday party, what else? It's one of the things which you need, which you need to keep you awakened, you know, in the night. And what we can do actually, and we have many uh, challenges specific for DDoS. So I a brief explanation. I will go into details for every specific part, like topic I mentioned here. It's like telemetry, how we actually export information about IPv6 traffic, BGP for IPv6, black hole implementation, and traffic engineering. And actually, when we are talking about enabling and deploying any kind of solution for uh, attack detection or network automation. First thing, you need to deliver traffic from your equipment in some ways, because plenty of ways actually to deliver it. And then one of the challenges here is like people who love old technologies. It's a really big problem because, you know, uh, one of the most popular network telemetry protocols, it's NetFlow. And you know, it has few versions, version five, version nine, version 10, which is also known as IPFIX. But problem is, you know, what is the point to use NetFlow version five? And actually one of the main things and main problems about protocol uh, NetFlow version five, it just has no field for IPv6 because it's so old protocol. And there are no reasons, actually, believe me, no reasons to use it. E because most of the net modern and network equipment support NetFlow nine or IPFIX or actually even better, my favorite one, SFlow. So just don't use it. But uh, unfortunately, if you can solve this kind of problem and your equipment supports um, IPv6 properly, and next thing it may be quite, you may experience quite rarely, you may find out way to send uh, network telemetry to your collector of IPv6 protocol. So they can carry information about IPv6, but not on many times, they cannot send this information from switch or router to IPv6 only uh, collector. So it's a big pro it's problem and you can actually yell on your Vendor, like, please fix it. But none of the problems are here mentioned like very serious. No, you, if you already use NetFlow 9 or SFlow or IP6, you already cover it. You have all stuff in place. And from perspective of FastNet mode, because FastNet mode is a tool which can notify you in case of like when specific host in your network experience so, like enormous spike of uh, traffic. Like typically you experience like no more than 100 megabits for specific, host, but then suddenly it is just like one gigabit or 10 gigabits. And we need to like read information from telemetry about like, what is IP address for this host? What is the target? What is the source? And actually it's only single change which was required to enable IPv6 support in FastNet Mon telemetry engine. So it's literally single sync. Like if you received, field in NetFlow 9 from the left side or IP fix on the right side, which has like 16 bytes and specific number because actually this uh, like it's constant IPv6 SRC other it's it's part of standard there's RFC about IPv6 or Cisco's implementation about NetFlow 9 and that's all you have it in place you can decode it no fancy decoding just like array of 16 bytes 
fine, simple. So even from, uh, you know, typically you don't deal and don't implement this stuff from, from your network manually in coding, but we did because, you know, it's our purpose. And you can see it wasn't rocket science. It was literally just like, you know, a few hours before. And next thing, IPv6. Will you experience any kind of issues with IPv6 about BGP protocol? It actually depends on your position because if you just operational like engineer, you just enable it and it works. But unfortunately, under the hood, it's quite tricky actually because it's because we can, it, NLRI for IP4 was implemented not very flexible way because nobody imagines that some sync with like IPv6 will emerge. Nobody expected it. And that's actually why switch from IPv4 for BGP to IPv6 is quite uh, uh, for BGP. It's quite painful if you are maintainer or developer of BGP demand. In this case, you need to completely change encoding protocol because different addresses, different way to encode stuff. And unfortunately, when we started implementation it in Fastnet mode, so we stuck. So because in Fastnet mode, we use uh, Go BGP, BGP Diamond. If you, ha if you haven't tried it, I would recommend. It's really nice. It's really simple, it's Office API, command line tool. It implemented a fancy uh, programming language in Go. It's very secure, not extremely fast, but it's perfect for task of like, when you need to inject some, you know, prefix, read something from your routers, establishment, and it says supper for plenty of very like unusual protocols, like IPv6, uh, MPLS, VPN, like many of them. And one of the actually roadblocks we experienced when we started work on a, I think IPv6 announcement for fast network. So actually, when like when your IPv6 host attacked by like bad guys, we need to like notify you, of course, via script or what else, or email. And also, we need to notify your routers to like stop sending traffic, like just keep our network alive. And actually, when we tried and we finished the implementation for code, we started making this. And one of the things we experienced, it, it was like, next hop is not supported because actually it was bug in GoBGP and thanks to this guy from Cisco, he fixed it. And for our site, it was just upgrade to new version and then here you go, it works. I think it's a great example how open source works because when one open source project depends on di different one, like, you know, you can just ask people to implement it, but typically, they had same problems because I suppose this hit exactly the same problem. Like they tried to make IPv6 announce and unfortunately it failed because you know, next just now we try to use IPv6 announces and got BGP with IPv6 next hop. I, I don't know why actually, maybe they used like IPv4 next hop. It's very unlikely, but maybe not, nobody tried. So, but it's good stuff. So we finished it, we implemented it. It's only one thing we just changed its version of got BGP. And so it works fine. No issues. And I would say from many vendors, you know, no issues with like BGP IP6 implementation, like not for this connection. I never heard about them. It's very old stuff. It would just work most of the time. You may experience like issues with like new implementation of BGP, like got BGP, but you can see it can be easily sorted. So again, no problem from BGP perspective. And also, so as this project was successful, we enabled option to notify your border routers or like different BGP speaking device about like you are under attack using custom community, uh, next hops. And one of the things actually, it's very, very good because for communities, nothing changes because you know, we just used exactly the same logic as IPv4 because only one thing which changes between when you move from BGP IPv4 to IPv6, you just replace NLRI encoding because in BGP packet, it will be just empty to uh, employ each uh, attribute, which is quite complex encoding like this, like with many fields, but it's again, it's not rocket science and it's typically hidden from you by developers. What kind of problems we may have as next step? So let me guess, uh, BGP black hole. Uh, because uh, when I started to talk about black hole uh, DDoS attack types, uh, I did not mention that what kind of mitigation we have in this case. But unfortunately, in many cases and for many companies, they don't have enough capacity to, to absorb and scrub or filter out DDoS attack. They need to keep their network alive. And from this perspective, when we are talking about like, about like maybe residentialized IP, which use IPv4 only, or like small or medium-sized or large scale, 
cloud provider or even worse, like some cloud secure uh, cloud surveys. One of the problems they have because you know because of cost of IPv4, it's enormous, really, it's expensive. And that's why people typically stuff single IPv4 address with many, 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 many services. And actually, when you start talking with people like, okay, if your specific host is this DDoS attack, you can just block it and then go forward, fine, no problem. And then people like, oh no, everything, everything on this specific IPv4 address because it was so costly for us. Because you know, it's 15 bucks per IP address, but you know, when you buy in bulk, but for small ranges, it's even more expensive. And when you rent it from uh, your cloud provider or your residential ISP or your for business, it's much more expensive. And in some places of planet, like example, China, it's even more expensive. So you cannot afford buying lots of IPv4 addresses. That's why people like it many, many, many services. But what we have for IPv6, like normal address space. So, you know, Typically, you receive at least slash 64 from your ISP. And then, what does it mean? So instead of using ports, I would say like, this port for DNS service, this port for HTTP, this port for HTTPS service, and, and sharing many services, like HTTP service using virtual host on same like IP address, you can allocate actually single IPv6 address or even worse, I mean, I mean it's better. Uh, different subnets for different services. Like your company provides 100 different uh, microservices or APIs. Fine, I like it different IP slash 64 or even bigger networks for them. And what is the benefits of this approach? It may sound like complex, like so many IP addresses and need some things to tell, like to maintain them because as I said, going crazy, like what is, what is IP address for the service? But it's very beneficial because in, you know, for IPv4, if you experience DDoS, you cannot move specific IP address to a scrapping center, like, or ask for like for well-known vendors on market to filter it out for you because it's a limitation of BGP protocol. You cannot, you cannot move slash 32. You can move slash 24, but again, it's expensive and it's stuff it with services. You cannot move it easily, but for IPv6, I heard actually great story from one of the uh, users of Fastnet one because actually what they actually do is they allocate for because they're a cloud provider and they allocate slash forty eight for every service and every customer which use their service. What is the benefits of this approach? Maybe it sounds like oh they are wasting so much IP so addresses, but it's extremely beneficial because it's not they can of course use BGP black hole. To isolate specific surveys of specific customer instead of blocking whole customer completely. And even actually better, they can reroute specific prefix in the cloud scribing center, center in case of DDoS. It's, I think it's really great stuff, not only just blocking it, because actually typically it implemented first way, you need to block it because otherwise your network will experience downtime. And next thing you need to think about what is a better option? And then you can like, sign contract and ask for emergency help from cloud scribing servers, plenty of them, you can find. And then just move this specific IPv6 prefix to them. And here you go, finally, this specific customer is covered. Instead of just black holding this one, you can, you know, save them and provide great service and very precise service. And, but one of the things which is quite, as I mentioned, it's very flexible. You can easily move traffic around to different parts of planet. You may you can move actually traffic to different data centers which has more capacity because if you, typically yeah, like if you work for a big company, you may operate big distributed network. Like for example, in like somewhere in maybe in London, you have lots of capacity, but in this specific location, maybe somewhere in the Indonesia, you don't have it. Then using IPv6 addressing, you can easily move all traffic away from this small location to big location and scrub it, filter it out, use all your available tricks for it. Uh, but one of the things which is quite unfortunate because many ISPs, of course they support black hole community for IPv6 protocol, but it implemented only 128 bases. So you can black hole specific address, but sometimes you will need to block like slash 64 or maybe even bigger network. So it's a good point to clarify with your ISP what's boundaries, what you can afford blocking. 
and it depends on your other thing because you need to understand like we can sacrifice this prefix, but we cannot sacrifice like slash 48. And so mostly for many cases, if your ISP provides IPvC transport for you, it's perfectly fine. So typically they will provide black hole for you and uh, that's good news. No problem. Again, no roadblocks in this case. And as I explained in previous, because you know, I black hole in traffic engineering is quite related because it's actually, I covered many things from, from this slide on previous slide. And because one of the things I would like to mention, like many people talking around like about any cost, like, you know, it's, it's really just when, when you're not exactly the same service from many, 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 many locations. Uh, but when people tell it typically, oh, it's expensive, it's deadly expensive. No, you cannot afford it. If you're a small company, you cannot afford it. Fortunately, you can. So you can implement any cast over IPv6 because even basic allocation from RIPE can be a slash 32. Then it means that you have plenty of slash 48 and then you can locate many number of may, many different locations and be happy. Spread load this way, deliver traffic to like data center, which actually is backend for service and handle. It's much more flexible ways than IPv4 because for IPv4, we cannot move this search 24 prefix because you know, it's expensive. And we reach a point of most sophisticated and complicated challenge of IPv6 automation. So we have BGP session with our upstream. We can block traffic. IPv4, IPv6, fine. We have information about network telemetry, what actually happening in our network. But what we can do if it happens in the middle of night is a night. Okay, somebody will call us, pager duty, I mean, make us angry, ruin a few days. We have different options. So uh, main point of this presentation was like, you know, I'm very happy to announce that in Fastnet Mon community, we added support for IPv6, complete one. Back in time, we had like small pieces of IPv6 support implemented in it. But current version, because actually it was so big change, and that's why actually we decided to split it into version. And you can, you know, find out uh, our GitHub page and install it. And current stable version is 119. And it includes every single change and every single uh, like feature required for IPv6 uh, mitigate uh, our attack detection. So you will, if you start, if you like download Fastnet on configured, it will be actually implement very simple thing. It will read a stream of NetFlow or SFlow information from your routers. It will calculate number, what is the current bandwidth for your specific host in your network, not remote one. It's quite common misunderstanding. So, it will maintain counter, like for this specific host for in my network, we have 10 megabits, for this one, five gigabits, for this one, maybe nothing. And every second or more often it tracks, it compares value of like packet rate per second for this host, number of TCP packets per second, flows per second, many, many actually so many different kinds of thresholds with support. And then when specific host exceeds this, it calls actions. So it can be a script call. It's not, not very important, but of course it's very crucial for implementation. It can pass information to pager duty, like we are, we, are, we are being attacked. And next thing, because Fastnet Mode was built with automation in mind. It wasn't built like tool which can help you to fight those. It was built as tool which can automate process to fight into those. And then what we can do to automate it completely because, to, because you know, typically somebody wake up to you in, in the middle of the night and then you try to find out your coffee machine. I mean, no, 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 not coffee machine. You're trying to find out access to your routers to create actually these big hole announce. And with fast network, you can create this automatically. So when some host in your network, like you maybe you residential ISP with like 100 megabits plan exceeds specific threshold, like maybe one gigabit, it will be blocked automatically by Fastnet mode. It, it can, can do it for IPv6 too. And curr currently it works on boundaries on 128, but if you operate on boundaries or a slash uh, 64, it's perfectly fine. We will need just make small change or just raise issue at GitHub and we will expose it as configuration because I already hear that like some people can like 
unhappy about implementation of it for 128 because they like a bigger chunks and bigger networks for specific customer. And then it will solve your problem mostly and cover main challenge of uh, DDoS mitigation for IPv6 protocol. And so this one is just dash, like how it looks from a uh, command line because its main way how you can monitor uh, fastnet one from command line. Oh, of, of course we have support for InfluxDB, Grafana, many different ways to export traffic information, but this one is main one because you can see all your, actually this one is my home connection from British Telecom and I'm very happy to have IPv6 at my home because it helps a lot with testing because sometimes it was, it's just complicated to find out like we need some real IPv6 traffic, how I can find out, enable IPv6 for your home. So, and then you can see like many hosts, bandwidth for them, flow rate, and actually it scales very well. And we have confirmed deployment of customers with two more terabits of capacity. So no limitation, no issues. And if you hit any issues, bugs, just you just said uh, GitHub. And so uh, if you want to try FastNetMon, uh, we support all major Linux distributions. I mean, Debian, all nine, Debian 10, Ubuntu, LTS, all, all of them actually from 14, 16, 18, 20, 0 point, uh, 4. And we have support for CentOS 5, uh, 6, 7, and 8. So if you're scary because, you know, many people like, because, yeah, we're talking about security. And then you see like sudo, like start some very, very weird script from the internet. And if you're scared enough, actually just open this script and find out URL because in, under the hood, it just creates, it detects your operation system and downloads binary package, which you can download manually without using core scripts because, because it's just for convenience, not for, you know, we would like to ask you for like, for running some very strange thing using super user permissions. And so if you have any questions, you can find out me at GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and I will be happy to answer questions.